on the final day of competition at the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. A teenager from Philadelphia climbed into the ring, ready for his final bout in the 125 pound weight class. He was part of one of the best American boxing teams ever assembled, including future Hall of Famers Evander Holyfield and Purnell Whitaker. Their take would be eight gold medals. Meldrick Taylor was trying to make it nine. And when he got to the Olympic Games, he was 17 years old. He was sort of the baby of that team and a vastly talented fighter. But you had much bigger names on that team, much older guys. The winner in the red corner, Meldrick Taylor of the United States of America. But once he became a pro, uh, he quickly became the, the class of that class. Meldrick became the star. Taylor with a good left again, and Lexi goes down. He developed faster. Good stuff from Meldrick Taylor. He was flashier. Meldrick's speed certainly has to be respected. He could do everything. A lot of people thought he was a new Ray Leonard. Melvin Taylor was dazzling. He had hand speed. He had good foot movement. I don't know if there's been too many fighters in the last 25 years who were any more fun to watch. They could snap off these seven, eight punch combinations just in the blur of an eye. But I think his greatest strength and perhaps his greatest weakness was he was a Philadelphia fighter. <laughs> he thought of himself as a fighter more than a boxer. Which was the tradition passed down through the years in gritty North Philadelphia, a boxing neighborhood renowned for its gym wars and for producing legends like Smokin' Joe Frazier. As a kid growing up in North Philly, Meldrick Taylor wrote a promise to himself in black magic marker. It read, I will be a champion someday. To do so, he would box and fight the Philadelphia way. <laughs> A Philadelphia fighter is basically fighters that has a lot of heart, a lot of desire. They come to fight every minute, every round. He had the mindset and he had the history. This is my home. What Meldrick wanted to be, in a way, was Joe Frazier. Meldrick Taylor was too much of a Philadelphia fighter. He had real quickness and boxing skills, but that he loved to get in there and fight and sometimes when it wasn't to his best advantage. But he's flailing away, this is a brawl. But that's what made him the outstanding young fighter he was. Elder Taylor could not be more impressive. In just his 21st professional bout, Taylor fulfilled his childhood dream. A wicked right hand by Taylor. When he upset Buddy McGirt to win his first title. And the brand new junior runaway champion, Meldrick. TNT Taylor. He was in demand. Uh, the crowd loved him. TV loved him. He entertained. He threw punches. He boxed. He danced. For Flash, you couldn't beat Melvin Taylor. But Taylor, with his Philadelphia heart, was determined to prove himself as more than Flash. What better way than to beat the least flashy fighter in the sport? A budding legend who appeared to be Taylor's polar opposite in nearly every way. Mexico's Julio Cesar Chavez. Chavez, unloaded. Chavez was regarded as the best pound for pound fighter in the world, but more than that, he was regarded as the toughest son of a bitch in boxing. He articulated all the virtues that Mexican fighters are supposed to have. He didn't submit to the odds, he kept coming. Julio Cesar Chavez was only 27 years old. But since rising from an impoverished upbringing in Culiacan, Mexico, he had already earned the stature of a Mexican folk hero. Chavez! Chavez! Chavez is something different, something extra natural. Julio Cesar Chavez! Chavez always fights for the Mexican flag. People, they don't care, they don't go to war just to see him fight. What? Mexican fight fans loved about Julio Cesar Chavez is that he endured incredible amounts of pain in order to win fights for them. That's the Mexican passion. Outlast, outwork, outfight, outbattle. By 1990, Chavez had already won four titles and successfully defended them 13 times. 
His undefeated record gave him an aura of invincibility. Chavez was 66 and 0, the quintessential Mexican fighter. Take three to land one. Wear you down with his relentless aggression and toughness. He was the workman. He was the plumber. You know, Meldrick was the guy driving the Jaguar, and Chavez pulled up in an SUV. But then he might run over your Jaguar with the SUV. People wondered who could get to Julio Cesar Chavez. And most people believed that if anybody was going to do it, it would be Meldrick Taylor. For people who like to follow boxing, this is what you live for. Two great fighters, same weight class, both in their prime. Boy, it had everything. It was in the ballroom at the Las Vegas Hilton. That building held 9,200 people. And I would say about 7,000 were people from the Culiacan neighborhood. So in the past 50 years, no professional boxer has begun a career and sustained unbeaten success for as long as has Julio Cesar Chavez. Melrick Taylor is really up for the fight. The familiar Lou Duva and his lieutenants will lead their charge, Meldrick Taylor, out of his dressing room. We all thought that he would win the fight because he just threw too many punches. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I was really thrilled to be selected for this fight. And your referee is Richard Steele. I know that Julio Cesar Chavez has never fought a fighter like Melger Teller. Chavez's eyes are focused on the midriff of Meldrick Taylor. He is thinking body from the outset. Taylor was unintimidated by the pressure. Chavez was just a target, moving into his range. Taylor lands a vicious right hand. Look at the speed of Meldrick Taylor's flurry. Brilliant stuff from Meldrick Taylor. The drama in this fight early on was that Taylor was dominating a terrific fighter. Taylor still trading four blows to one for Chavez. Nobody expected that to happen. With the first four rounds, Meltrick Taylor would appear to have built an early lead. Boxing, moving, punches and bunches. His fluid hand speed and combinations, clearly reminiscent of Ray Leonard at his best. Whoa, beautiful combination. Brady punches inside, and Chavez again seems to wobble slightly as Taylor lands at will. The hand speed of Melcher Taylor was superior, totally superior, and nullified the offense of Chavez. He's been doing what he needs to do, just boxing, using speed. Taylor was way ahead. And as round five comes to a close, Meldrick Taylor throws his gloves skyward in celebration of his performance so far. He was winning the fight. Now you're boxing beauty, though. There's no doubt in anybody's mind. This is why we try to hold him up a little bit and slow him down. Now just settle down, settle down. Don't let the guy carry you too fast. Because we saw the fight maybe going into the 12th round, and we wanted to hold him back a little bit so he had enough to turn it on in case he needed it. But through the middle rounds, Taylor showed no signs of slowing down. It's hard to imagine Taylor being more effective. Hard to imagine him doing a better job of rising to the biggest occasion of his career. Even Chavez's staunchest supporters were in shock. The male dictator was dominating Chavez for like for nine, ten rounds. Even the, the Chavez calling said, come on, do it for your family, for your sons, for everybody, for your country. You're losing the fight. For your family, Julio. They know how desperate the situation is. He was an unbeaten young champion fighter, fighting the fight of his life against one of the greatest fighters in the sport, and I thought that he won the first nine rounds of the fight. You're in the middle of the ninth round of a classic performance by a young fighter on the threshold of greatness. Taylor may well have won every round. Yeah, I thought that uh, Taylor was decisively winning the fight. I thought he was really giving Chavez a boxing lesson. It was clear to almost everyone that Taylor was giving a virtuoso performance. But it was clear to one man that something else was happening. I knew that Melcher Teller was winning the fights because he was landing two to one. But at the same time, I saw Julio Cesar Chavez landing these hard punches, hard shots, shots that would break bones. Most of the audience 
didn't know how much of a beating that this young man was taking. It's incumbent on Taylor not to give Chavez an unnecessary chance to get back into this. We started to see very gradually that there was a shift. Taylor was landing punches, but Chavez was starting to land more hurtful ones. There is swelling around both of Meldrick Taylor's eyes. You were giving him round after round, and then you looked up and said, you know, what happened to this guy? <laughs> he looked like he'd been hit by a windmill. Taylor beginning to look more the worse for wear than the action of the bout would have led you to believe, though. I think Julio was turning the tide. I still don't think he was winning rounds, but he was punishing Meldrick physically from the middle rounds of the fight on, and, and that ultimately was going to tell the tale. Chavez finally seizing the initiative for the first time in round 10. And for the first time, there's a mild air of danger from Eldrick Taylor. He knew he was losing the, the fight, but he also knew that he was extracting a cost from Eldrick Taylor to win each one of those rounds. Blood again from the mouth and the nostril. The issue became, can I get him before they say the fight's over? As round 11 comes toward a close, and Taylor was woozy and almost went to the wrong corner finally came down to the 12th round. And he was winning the fight. Sure, he got hit some shots, but he was in condition. And we tell him in the corner, look, this is the last round. No, this is the last round. The whole fight's right now. But the advice Lou Duva remembers offering, and what was actually said in the corner, differ just a bit. Move, move, move. Dance, 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 you know? I mean, um, make believe you're my Muhammad Ali out there. Have a little fun out there, but don't fight. You need it now. You need this now. You're winning the fight. You don't have to fight the 12th round. No, the fight is hanging on this round here, Mel. This is okay, yeah. champ. This is the last and final round. No, you want to be champ of the world? His corner was telling him, it's close. You got to go out there and fight. The fight is hanging on this round here, Mel. This is okay. It wasn't even close. I didn't know what fight the corner was watching. Mildred Taylor was not going to back down from Chavez. He was not going to give Chavez the satisfaction of making him fight in a manner not befitting a Philadelphia fighter. Cuts go, cuts go. If you're a fight fan, get ready for three minutes of high drama now as a desperate and determined Julio Cesar Chavez tries to take out a fading and battered Meldrick Taylor who has completely dominated him through most of the fight. Early in round 12, the only question on everybody's mind was, can Taylor finish the fight on his feet? If he does, he wins. Two minutes to go. Maybe two minutes left in Julio Cesar Chavez's historic unbeaten streak. It was like watching someone leading the Boston Marathon for 25 miles and they're falling apart. That is a tired Meldrick Taylor slipping to the canvas. Can this guy just get to the finish line? Both of Taylor's eyes are closing. The blood continues to flow from his nose and his mouth. But if he stands up, he wins. I do remember feeling that the sand was running out of Taylor's hourglass. So I'm watching, and I'm thinking, is this kid going to be able to finish? There it was, 25 seconds left in the round. You know who was winning the fight. And all of a sudden. If he gets up, he probably wins the fight. Five seconds left. I cannot believe they stopped that fight. I was shocked when Steele stopped the fight. The official time will be 2.58 of the 12th round. He knocked him out with two seconds left. What are you doing stopping this fight? You're giving a victory away. This guy's earned the right. He's a champion. He got up. What are you doing stopping the fight? Richard, you describe the end of the fight and why you stopped it. Well, Larry, I stopped it because, you know, Melger had took a lot of good shots, a lot of hard shots. When that famous right hand that Julio Cesar Chavez landed, 
He went down like there was no more life in him. He got up. He pulled himself up. And I asked him twice, are you all right? Are you all right? And he could not continue. I don't care about the time. When I see a man that has enough, I'm stopping the fight. Not only was I infuriated, I was Italian mad. He says, I don't know what time it is. All I know is I've got a hurt fighter in front of me. I don't want him to get hit anymore. Bullshit. I don't believe that there. He got up. He, count, he started to pick up the count. At six, he got up. I thought we had got jobbed. This fight should have been mine. This should have been in the basket. I had Lena on the scorecards. And then it was premature that Richard Steele would do something like this. The controversial ending was filled with subplots. Taylor's trainers were criticized for convincing him that he needed to win the final round. Lou Duva was criticized for jumping onto the ring apron, which distracted Taylor and caused him to look to his right just as Steele asked him to respond to critical questions. And Steele was criticized for not being aware of the flashing red light right behind Taylor that signified the last 10 seconds of the 12th round. His decision immediately became one of the most debated in boxing history. I think that Richard Steele made a bad stoppage. Meldrick Taylor had fought his heart out. He had earned the right of those extra two seconds. It was hard initially to step back and really look at what had happened. Uh, one guy got assaulted at the end is what happened. So should they have stopped the fight? Yeah, they should have stopped the fight. His expression said it all. I mean, uh, he couldn't believe that he lost today. Every time I think about that fight, I think about that expression on his face. If the fight had gone to the scorecards, Meldrick Taylor would have won a split decision victory. But no matter the outcome, he paid a high price. I examined Meldrick right after the fight, sent him to the hospital. Meldrick had a facial fracture. He was urinating pure blood. His face was grotesquely swollen. This was a kid who was truly beaten up to the face, the body, and the brain. You rarely see guys of that world-class caliber beaten so decisively to the point where their bodies are utterly gone. Once it's beaten out of you, it's gone forever. From Culiacan, Mexico, Julio Cesar Chavez. In Mexico, this fight turned Chavez into a heroic, almost legendary figure. Chavez would remain unbeaten for the next 21 fights before finally losing in 1994. Meldrick Taylor never truly recovered. Meldrick Taylor lost everything that night. He didn't just lose a title belt. He was never going to be Meldrick Taylor again. In the years following the loss to Chavez, Taylor's life and career propelled into a downward spiral, marked by diminished skills inside the ring financial and legal problems outside of it. And most worrisome, this. Oh, it's funny not to me because I, the media wrote bad things about me. The now my name said I was washed up. Today at 36, Taylor continues to fight, despite evidence that he shouldn't. Meldrick is the classic great champion that won't quit someone that continued on with his career as best he could, but who shows all the evidence of chronic brain injury. I mean, I'm at the beginning of the prime of my career, and I think I'm going to really excel in, in this fight. I'm going to propel me as the best fighter pound for pound in the world. It's going to make me a superstar. People say a lot of things about, about me, about my career. I shouldn't be fighting no more, and it's not true. So I'm here to prove myself that I'm still the same fighter I was. This man should not be in the ring, should not be training in the gym. It makes me feel embarrassed for the sport that anyone would allow him to fight. If I had to use one word of where Meldrick Taylor's life is now, I would say tragic. But he should have had his victory for his own personal pride, for the satisfaction of knowing that he did it. Because Meldrick Taylor was special. You just don't see many better fights. Skill, will, close competition, bizarre circumstances, strong personalities, that fight had it all.
It turned out to be a great fight and really a great moment in my life. I never regretted what I did. He was as barbaric as it was beautiful. It was probably the best fight of the decade.